Well, I'm available to start at right tackle. You can't see when I close on. Right. Well, there's not an even playing field. There's never been an even playing field. There never will be an even playing field. <laughs> what shampoo do you use on your hair? You don't need to be Superman to play in this offense. You're listening to The Red Zone. Welcome, Badgers fans, to another episode of The Red Zone. I'm your host, Jason Galloway, with the Wisconsin State Journal, and our guest today is Tim May from the Columbus Dispatch. He's been covering Ohio State since... Uh... Since Methuselah. No, <laughs> since since uh, the Stone Age, since 1984. That's that, that's the Stone Age. No, that's how far I go back. Uh, Ohio State played at, at Wisconsin in 1984. Keith Byers was going to win the Heisman, the Heisman Trophy at Shike, and... Uh, on the last offensive play of that game for Ohio State, Keith Byers caught a little pass over the middle. Guy hit him and he twisted his ankle. And uh, the next two weeks uh, were against Northwestern and Indiana, back when they were Northwestern and Indiana, if people remember, when they weren't very good. And he would have had 200 yards by halftime in each game or run away with the Heisman. Instead, he, had, he nursed this high ankle sprain all the way through the end of the season. Still ended up with Ohio State's uh, career rushing re- or season rushing record. but. You know, that's the year that Doug Flutie won the Heisman Trophy with the Hail Mary at the end oh, of the yeah. game against Miami and kind of stole the Heisman Trophy. So, yeah, that's how far I go back. I remember that game, uh, Wisconsin pulling the big upset, Ohio State bouncing back and winning the Big Ten outright with two losses in the conference for the first and only time ever by, by a team. Uh-huh. So, yeah, that's how far I go back. I just could give you a Wisconsin connection. <laughs> yeah. I think that was before I was born. So. It was, probably. <laughs> but you can um, read about it in all the history books. Yeah. Um, well, we're here at Big Ten Media Days in Chicago. Um, how, I mean, when was the first one of these? Like, how long does this go back, and how much, how much has it grown? I think grown? this is the 47th one, and it's okay. grown It's grown pretty big. But it, but it was pretty big back when I first started coming up here in 1984. It was already pretty big. Matter of fact, I think the one I came to in 84 was in this building. Was, uh, we're in the Marriott on the Magnificent Mile uh, as we speak. And it was in, I believe it, it was in this building. And uh, it was still pretty packed, man. There were a lot of thriving daily newspapers back then. And, uh, <laughs> and every one of them had two or three reporters up here. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. But, it was, you know, I always looked at it. You know, they had the Skywriters Tour a long time ago for different conferences. And they kind of went away. But this was your chance to sit down at a table with uh, whomever the co- you know coach was at different schools like Bo Beckler, Earl Bruce at Ohio State, uh, Hayden Fry at Iowa, guys like that, uh, for the one time when, all year when you could actually have a face-to-face conversation with those guys. Otherwise, you were covering your own little ballywick. Yeah, and, you know, the first year I covered <laughs> Media Days, I think it was 2015, they had these round tables like, where so you actually... a long time ago, man. <laughs> where you actually sat... At a table with these head coaches and talk to them, and now they. Um, well, here's what they found a, out, yeah. Jason. They found out the round table didn't really work because you'd have a round table and the coach would sit there and, like Joe Pa, for example, Joe Paterno, people would gather around. You couldn't hear Joe Paterno in the in the last <laughs> several years of his times coming here unless you were right next to him, like you and I are right now, almost nose to nose. People ought to see this, get a picture of this. But but. But the, what they figured out is that really didn't work. You need some amplification for some of these guys. And yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's. But you know, you got to admit, you know, you can. People can gripe about the crowd all they want, you know. But it kind of reminds me of what Yogi Berra said a long time ago. Nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded, you know, about a restaurant. Yeah. Well, if you you know if you don't like it, just don't show up. But <laughs> but you can get a question asked, you know, if you're if you're uh, persistent and have patience. Yeah, I did feel like. For some coaches, the round table it would it would help them open up a little bit more. But I mean, I do see the challenges in it, so yeah. it's it's kind of well. Imagine yeah. imagine this: you're sitting there and you're getting a question about the offense. Then you're getting a question about the new redshirt rule. Then you're getting a question about, uh, for example, Urban Meyer fired his uh, wide receivers coach yesterday, as we yeah. speak. Of, and uh, you're getting a bunch of questions about. I mean, the the questions are potpourri. You know, they just come from all different angles, and it from all different angles uh, from, a, from a story standpoint for guys and it's kind of an interesting uh, in my opinion an interesting exercise for these guys to go through for an hour yeah did anything stand out to you these last uh, couple of days here anything that uh, surprised you or just, just really stood out no you know the interesting part is uh, just from uh, looking forward to the season is uh, it's amazing and I'm not knocking it because this is all you have to go on is what's happened you know but People, you know, make the mistake of looking at college football 
<clears throat> and this is why I don't like preseason polls. They look at it more of like how last year ended instead of how this year could start. And like for example, you know, Jim Harbaugh is under tremendous fire from the media, for example, because of, he's one in five against Ohio State and Michigan State as two main rivals, two stated rivals. Uh, yet, if you really look at it, number one, you dig in there, he was a spot you know, on fourth down at, at Ohio State two years ago uh, from beating Ohio State, and he was a ridiculous block punt, drop punt thing away from beating Michigan State. <clears throat> we all remember that play. And he'd be three and three, you know, and yeah. so it was the narrative which is, but my point is this, you know, people are kind of like looking at Michigan as like the fourth best team in the East. This is an example, and they're – they kind of miss the idea that Michigan's got almost everybody back on defense except Mo Hurst, who, by the way, was probably the best defensive lineman in the, in the Big Ten last year, and Maurice Hurst. And uh, uh, and they can't be worse on offense. You know, basically we've got Shea Patterson coming in, who, though, as you remember, I asked uh, Jim Harbaugh during the big interview deal yesterday, you know, what – Everybody's assuming he's going to be the starting quarterback, and he goes, "I'm not ready to make any announcements yet." You know, yeah. but the bottom line is they, they should be at least as good. And my point is, uh, I think that's sort of the the thing that stands out is everybody's kind of harping on what just happened or what happened a year ago, and I think Michigan is going to be a factor big time in this in this race. And of course, the Big Ten East could come down to Ohio State versus Michigan in Ohio Stadium in the late November to decide who the Big Ten East champion is. That's that's one of the stories. The other is obviously. All of these coaches are endorsing this new rule about the red shirt where red shirts, you know, now can play up to four games in four games and not lose the red shirt thing, which gives yeah. – number one, allows you to keep those guys happy if they're worthy of playing. Number two, it allows you to save them for later. Uh, and number three, uh, it increases your depth later in the year when attrition <clears> – when the, the attrition factor starts kicking in. You can maybe play some of those guys. And every coach <clears throat> loves that rule. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, like I was talking to, for example, P.J. Fleck yesterday, and I said, you know, this is a rule that made sense 30, 30 40 years ago when know, you cut yeah. scholarships to like 85, you know. <clears throat> and he goes, yeah, it's funny how just a perfect rule it takes forever for people to realize, hey, this will work. Because, you know, how long have you been covering Wisconsin? About four years. Four years. Yeah. Well, you know, bottom line is this red shirt where you – play a guy for a couple of games and all of a sudden he has an injury and uh, I'm talking about a freshman or something, has an injury and can't play the rest of the year. Yeah. A lot of these injuries sometimes were sort of mysterious, you know, and, and then you had to, uh, apply, but my point is you could get your red shirt saved for him, that player, by applying for what they call a medical hardship yeah. so he can, you know, but it made you wonder how many of those injuries were real injuries and things like that. So now you can legitimately play guys, keep them happy, etc. I think that's a, I think that's a big deal. And, you know, of course, we're all talking about the gambling, legalized gambling. You, you'll be able to bet on Wisconsin football or, what you know, yeah. Ohio State football. Maybe, like, Ohio, you know, Columbus has got a casino there in town. And, you know, where they're, when their bookmaking operation is going to begin, I'm not sure. But, you know, that's going to have an impact. But, you know, people have always been fishing around major football programs for information. <laughs> yeah, the thing about – Other than yeah. us. <laughs> it's always amazed me. How games go off the board. I don't know if you pay attention to that. Go off yeah. the board in Vegas sometimes, and you know that's. Then you go, wait a minute. I better ask somebody some questions. Was that off the board? You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of we don't find yeah. out something. Yeah. A lot of times, that's you know they don't know if someone's injured or you know. Well, things like sometimes that, they do yeah. know. That's the point, you know. But yeah, now, yeah, yeah. but this idea that now they're, they they the push is for a universal injury report like the NFL has. Yeah. And uh, and uh, as uh, as Jim Delaney, the commissioner, said on Monday. Uh, it's more of like a participation report of who and who can't go on that Saturday, not necessarily saying what their injury is or why they're not playing, because we all know some guys don't play for reasons other than injury, you know, uh, violation of team rules, <laughs> which covers, which is like an umbrella policy in, in insurance. It covers a lot of ground. But, but yeah, just because I've always told, you know, because coaches have kind of, you know, Ohio State have always kind of given me grief about that about me asking I go I said you don't I mean you know there may be gamblers or something reading my stories and stuff but I just want to know who's who can and can't play just so people know who to expect to see on Saturday you know yeah remember the Jerry Seinfeld episode no Bette Midler <laughs> I you haven't know, seen that one you know it's like you show up for the Bette Midler show and uh, it's no Bette Midler she doesn't show it's got it <laughs> she got a you know somebody standing in so that's sort of the approach and now you know I'm all for that 
Now, when I emailed you last week to ask if you were to come on the podcast, I, I told you we would talk about Ohio State being a heavy favorite in the Big Ten. And then yeah. the, a couple of days later, the, the Cleveland.com poll came out, and um, almost as many people picked Wisconsin uh, to win the Big Ten than, than Ohio State, which kind of surprised me a little bit. You know, it seems like people, the narrative is that Wisconsin's kind of, you know, closed the gap on Ohio State and that they could they could make a run in the playoffs this year. Were you kind of surprised to see that? How do you, how do you kind of, no. you know, see that? Shaking out, um, do, do you think that Wisconsin is is a real threat this year to, to knock off Ohio State if they do meet in the championship game again? Especially under Paul Christ, I think Wisconsin's a hell of a program. I mean, I think they're better than they've ever been. They, I think it is better than it's ever been. I think the yeah. Badgers as a group are better than they've ever been just from a, I think from a depth standpoint of being the players that they want in their program. And number two, I told you a while ago, you know, a lot of people harken back to what happened last year to set the tone for this year. But I don't think that's illegitimate. When it comes to the the net, the Big Ten championship game I watched last year in Lucas Oil Stadium between Ohio State and Wisconsin, that was a hell of a game. People, yeah. oh, that's the thing about our society. We only remember who wins things. We don't remember who was in this, who was the loser in the Super Bowl, or you know. And they get poo pooed, but I think Wisconsin is right there from a, you know, let's. Here's the funny thing about Wisconsin that they, they kind of sneak up on people every year. Because they're they're not ballyhooed from the standpoint of who they've recruited, because they don't carry the same star, what do you want to call it, star ratings as like yeah. who Ohio State gets. But they recruit, they recruit extremely well to their program, and and by that I don't mean they're getting like one stars and turn them in. I think they find players that are damn good and bring them along, you know. And uh, but number two, they got their starting quarterback back, Horn- Hornibrook. I think he's going to be better than he was last year. I thought he went off the beam a few times last year, which cost him, especially that last possession in a Big Ten championship game, you know. Throws yeah. the ball <laughs> throws the ball to an Ohio State guy, you know. He's the only guy there. Uh, so, you think he's going to be better. You know, Ohio State's got a brand-new starting quarterback, probably, and Dwayne Haskins Jr., although Urban Meyer left that open, you know, for debate with uh, Tate Martell being there and, and Matthew Baldwin. But, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I think, that's, I think that's legit. I mean, these are two teams yeah. that played for it last year. There's no reason right now to think they won't end up there again. And you said Wisconsin. <laughs> t- you said Wisconsin typically sneaks up on people. And now, no, I now meant that. I I meant that from the standpoint of I don't think he, they get enough. I don't think they get enough pub based on people look at their rosters. Yeah. And all they remember is but, what these guys were rated when they were recruited. So they turn them into great a great football team. Well, yeah. Well, that's why that's I was. That's about. why I was surprised because I. I, I like I wouldn't be surprised if Wisconsin won the Big Ten this year, but I wouldn't either. But it surprised me that that people almost you know that the media picked them to win the Big Ten, or at least it was it was yeah. one vote less than Ohio State to win. Because well, yeah, a lot of times people look at Ohio State and the talent they have, and the like you said, the star ratings of their players, yeah. and yeah. Um, think you know they can have a lot of respect for Wisconsin. I think that they're gonna have a great season and make the title game. But when when push comes to shove, and they have to pick that title game between Ohio State and Wisconsin, I feel like. It's really easy to just pick Ohio State. Well, here's the thing: what, what you figure in a games like that, and you know, it's just like it's just like college basketball. You figure that eventually, what you would call the more thoroughbred player, you know, the the stellar player, that's where they make the biggest difference. Is in when th- a lot of other things are equal. When you've got that big time player that can make a play that the other team just doesn't have, you know, and maybe a great team, you know, that's that's kind of. That's that's kind of what I think people look at in those situations. But I, you agree with me? I don't know if you do or not. That was a that was a nip and tuck. You know, push come to shove affair last year. I mean, there was yeah, not it, a big difference between those two teams. Yeah, you know, for I think some people look at the game and kind of kind of forget that it went down to the wire yeah. when it really kind of did. That's what I'm because, saying. People forget. Quickly. I mean, Ohio State kind of kind of jumped on them, but then they had a couple of big defensive plays to get back in it, and, and they ended up having one drive oh, to win it. So, look at uh, Alabama. Alabama wins the national championship and is ballyhooed. And, you know, I grew up a big Alabama fan, so I'm sort of happy in my core. <laughs> but, uh, but the bottom line is Nick Saban had, had to go to a freshman, not a redshirt freshman, a freshman quarterback at halftime to, to basically save the day against Georgia, their heated rival. I believe that Georgia rivalry goes back a long ways. Even though they don't play every year, they've had some, they've had some knockdown, drag out fights over the last 80 years, and, uh, and that's my point. But th- but then Alabama gets all the credit, and Georgia gets you know gets kind of forgotten, even though they had an incredible season and came that close to winning the national championship. You know, that's the point I was yeah. making. 
I didn't know you were uh, grew up an Alabama fan. So that's, went to Alabama. That's my home. alma mater. Went to Alabama. You did. I'm no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Roll Tide, right? Uh, I went to Alabama home games from '61 to '64 with my dad, my older brother. Uh, so Bear Bryant would walk on water. Remember, he'd walk on <laughs> yeah. water from the. Uh, he'd walk across a moat on water to the field. <laughs> no. So I, I originated the comment before HBO made it famous that I saw Joe Namath play on two good knees. <laughs> he was a tremendous player back then. Then we moved to Texas and that all. Whatever. My, my dad was a graduate there in 1950. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, my uh, grandma and grandpa were buried in the, in the uh, cemetery, which is south, just south of Denny Stadium there. So it's like. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. The Calvary Baptist Church is right down the street there, like half a block. Yeah. You know, we used to go there on Sundays every now and then. So, yeah, I go way back with Alabama football. I feel, I feel like there's sort of this. Uh, there is this kind of assumption that Wisconsin's going to win the West, and I obviously I understand that. They're, they seem head and shoulders above everybody else in, in the West. But is there is there anybody you look at in that in that West division that you think, well, maybe maybe yeah. they could challenge them? Do you buy into the Nebraska hype? That some, you know, here's what here's what I buy into. Nebraska's going to be better because I think they're going to be better. I think Nebraska's going to be better on defense. Everybody's caught up in Scott Frost in the offense, and they should. Yeah. But let's face it, you. You've been around. You've been paying attention. Nebraska's been pretty damn good on offense, with a few exceptions. You know, the yeah, last yeah. the last many years, they just the black shirt mentality of the defense went away after they after they got. Uh, well, even when when Bo Pelini was there, they didn't play great defense, and he was, you know, part and parcel. That's how he got the head coaching job was what he was about on defense. And I don't know what happened there from a recruiting standpoint, whatever. But I I don't think it can be from the team I saw play Ohio State last year. They can't be worse on defense because Ohio State obliterated them for the second straight year. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, but uh, so I think they're going to be better on defense. Uh, matter of fact, I picked them. Funny, I picked them as my dark horse favorite last year in the Big Ten West, just because oh, I thought you? they'd be pretty. Thought they'd be better on offense than most people thought. But <clears throat> that was a bad pick. Uh, uh, and uh, you know how you just kind of look for a new face sometimes, you know. But I think uh, I think Jeff Brom is legit. At Purdue, I think. Yeah, that, I was impressed uh, with what they did last year. I think Pat Fitzgerald has a really good program that few people pay attention to for whatever reason. So that's why I asked Paul Christ in the uh, press conference today. You know, does he buy into the idea that the Big Ten East is the power part of the conference? And you know, he kind of answered it from a in a political way. But, you know, he knows the Big Ten West. I mean, there are teams there that are, that are coming on that are lethal, and they're all trying to get better, you know. And, uh, you know, the Big Ten East has uh, has Rutgers and Indiana, and Maryland, Maryland's coming on. But, yeah, it's dominated by the Big Four. And uh, that's as much from a publicity standpoint as anything else. But I think the Big Ten West is coming on. Don't you agree? I think there there's a lot of teams in the in the, that division that I think are sort of on the rise, like you mentioned. I think, I think Nebraska, you know, I don't – I'm not super high on what Nebraska will do this year, especially yeah. with their schedule, but I think long-term, Frost is going to do a good job there. I always judge, always judge coaches by what they do that second year. Yeah. Because the first year, you know, but the second year, most times there's magic involved if you're if it's big, you know, if it's going to be a big-time turnaround, which is what it was with Ohio State. And Urban Meyer went undefeated his first year. 2013, they came that close, even though they didn't have a defense that could stop me and you throwing the ball. Uh, they came that close to, to getting in the playoffs, you know. And then, uh, and of course, in 14, the first – College football playoff, they uh, they won it all. But I judge it by what you know what you do that second year. But I I think Nebraska has some talent offensively on hand. It's pretty nice. I like that new quarterback Adrian Martinez, and uh, of course he's a freshman. We'll see where that goes. But like I, like you just said, I think they're a year away. But you were asking me, do I think in the West there are some legit threats? Yeah, I mean Clayton Thorson at uh, is that his name at uh, at Northwestern? He's a nice quarterback. You know, Jeff Brom's got two quarterbacks. You didn't know he's going to play yet. You know, and they were. Legit last year as a bounce back program, and now the you now he's in his second year. So the team I think that might have the best chance to knock them off we haven't even mentioned yet is Iowa. Um, you September know why I didn't 20- mention Iowa? Why is that? I can't figure <laughs> Iowa out because they beat Penn. What they beat uh, Penn State three years ago over there. They beat Michigan two years ago, ruined their undefeated season. And then Ohio State beat them again. I'm talking about in 2016. And then Ohio State goes in there. After the greatest, one of the greatest games I've ever covered, Penn State, Ohio State, when they bounced, came back, came back, way behind, and, and they obliterated Ohio State. Ohio State 
It's like they had never seen passes thrown to tight ends. Before. It's like the most shocking result in college and, football last year. I know, but Bumpy Glide all along has been nobody ever covers a tight end in football, especially college football. Well, I will put three of them on the field, you know. <laughs> so there were three guys running around wide open. It was hilarious. Uh, but yeah, the most shocking upset in the Big Ten last year, without a doubt. Do you agree? Oh yeah. Uh, you know. Then they go to Wisconsin and what game? Had six first downs the next week. Yeah. I'm talking about number, uh, Iowa. Yeah. I mean, it's like they win these one big game a year just to make Kirk Ferentz, you know. Well, here's mythical. the thing. It's, he is mythical. Yeah. So Iowa hosts Wisconsin to open Big Ten play on September 22nd. If, if they win that game, they're in a really great position. If they can somehow find a way to upset Wisconsin, like you said, if that's their one you know, yeah. big game of the year where, yeah. they, where they upset somebody, yeah. uh, you know, Wisconsin's got to play at Michigan and at Penn State on yeah. the crossover games. And uh, I think Iowa has uh, – they have one good crossover opponent, but the other two are – are not as good. I think it's Indiana and Maryland. Yeah. And so if, if they if they can pull off that game and it's going to be, you know, it'll be Wisconsin's first test of the season. They don't have a, a good non-conference game. And so right. I think that that's it's going to be a lot of pressure on what the game think for Wisconsin. What do you think about that, by the way? Well, I think when they scheduled BYU, they you know they thought oh, yeah. that that team would be a little bit better than they are now. So I, I, I think, yeah, Ohio State when they scheduled Oregon State, they were a lot better. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. So yeah, I mean, Wisconsin's played. You know, they played LSU and Alabama the past few years, and right. I think they've been scheduling pretty well. It's just these these couple years where they had BYU as their as their major opponent, it looks really bad, yeah. and especially last year when they didn't, didn't have the crossover games in see, the East. See, I, see I, I'll, I'll go all the way back. Uh, I started voting the Associated Press Bowl back in 1984, you know, and uh, BYU wins in that. I mean, with Lavelle Edwards and stuff, that was a hell of a program, you know, and, yeah. and they were pretty damn good up until about – two or three years ago and they just fell off the beam like you're right I mean these games have to be made out there in perpetuity almost you know yeah, to, some to of them make are them eight, ten years in advance exactly so I'm not I'm not I'm not knocking them for skate I know exactly I was just being facetious there because BYU's not really I think it's still independent right or something but, yeah they're independent but so. not really uh, picked to beat anybody <laughs> yeah so but but you're right I mean but then again you know we all saw last year <clears throat> How many wins do you have at the end of the year besides whether you get in the college football playoff? And I kept arguing, yes, Ohio State got obliterated by Iowa. Ohio State still had as many FBS champion, FBS wins as Alabama did. Because Alabama, of course, before it got beat by Auburn, got beat by, by uh, who they play? Not Georgia Southern. Anyway, it might have been Georgia Southern. But the bottom line is, Ohio State had as many FBS wins as Alabama did. And Ohio State won the Big Ten championship over a team that was highly rated yeah. in Wisconsin. Alabama stayed home, watched uh, watched uh, uh, Georgia beat Auburn, upset Auburn, which had just beaten Alabama. You know, if Auburn wins that game, I don't think Alabama gets in the college football yeah. playoff. It would not have made sense. I would, I would have, you know, ripped that. It'd been like when people were talking in 2006 about Ohio State and Mich- Michigan having a repeat after the game of the century, playing again the next, you know, four weeks later for the national, you know, baloney. I've already seen that game, you know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, it's funny how that all worked, and all of a sudden the Big Ten's left out of the college football playoff, and for the first time in its four-year history, the college football playoff has two teams from the same conference. Baloney. That's BS. That should not happen. Yeah, everyone has their own. There's only four slots. One league shouldn't get two of them, even though Alabama ends up winning it. Well, I, I kind of disagree with you there. I mean, I think that – I don't care if you do. <laughs> you I, mean, I, I think you, you try to pick – the. I mean, you can disagree with who the best four teams were, but I, I don't think just because – there's two from the same conference. You know, two of the top four teams in the country could be in the same conference. It, it, it happens. I would, but I was just saying, I agree with that under, under other circumstances. But my point was, Ohio State has many, had as many, uh, like I said, FBS wins as yeah. Alabama did, and Ohio State, on top of that, had a conference championship, and Alabama didn't didn't play an extra Jeopardy game, is what I'm talking about. And uh, that's what I would just say. I would just I would just say, looking at their resumes. Ohio State had the better resume, except for this big black and gold splotch on it from uh, from Iowa. You know. Yeah. But that, that was really they hard. They both had. I mean, because, Auburn yeah. beating Alabama was kind of a shock to them, in in my opinion. But, you know. Yeah, because I. But it wasn't I, as big yeah. a shock. I vote in the AP poll as well, and <clears throat> it's uh, that that was a really tough. It was tough to to know how to rank Ohio State after you know when you have a loss like that against Iowa, but the rest of the. Or for the most part, of their season they have all these good wins too. It's 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 really it's really difficult sometimes to know exactly how to how to deal with something like that. But before I let you go here, 
Um, I'm just looking. Can I get a prediction uh, for the Big Ten title game? Are we done, or are you just jumping ahead? I'm not trying to cut you off. I swear. No, Big no. Ten title game? I tell you what. I mean, as much as I said, blah blah blah. I like Ohio State versus Wisconsin. The rematch. Uh, what do you think? I agree. I with who do you think is going to win though? That's that's the. Big I don't know. Question. I don't like to because I don't know how these teams are going to change. Is, yeah. is Dwayne Askins Jr. going to be what I think he is? Is Ohio State going to have this the most dynamic offense under Urban Meyer that he's had? When you look at the stats, it's pretty amazing to think that they could be the, the best offense they've ever they've had under Urban Meyer, which is led or had been at the top, near the top of the Big Ten since he's been there. It, it, you, get, you finally have a pocket passer kind of guy who's very accurate, who can, who can spread the field, the breadth, can throw passes the breadth of the field, which they didn't have the last few years under J.T. Barrett. He's not the runner J.T. was, but they have 2,000-yard backs. Sounds like a Wisconsin preseason <laughs> thing you know, from, from the old days. And they have a they have nine of, their, nine of the ten receivers who caught a, at least a pass last year are all back, so they should be better. And they've got a, a tight end now, a freshman, who will see if, how much he plays, Jeremy Rucker, who could stretch the field like you wouldn't believe. And uh, if he comes along like they think he will, might be a factor by then. I think, I, I think Ohio State has a chance to really change to be even better uh, as the season goes along, you know, not maybe start a little bit slow. They play at TCU the second game of the year. There's a third game of the year. I get them mixed up. But uh, – third game of the year they play at, T at TCU they're actually playing at AT&T Stadium the home of the Cowboys where they beat Southern Cal in the Cotton Bowl last year uh, that'll be an interesting game to watch I don't I don't think TCU is great but I think they're really good on offense so we'll see where that goes you know the Harbinger there but uh, uh, I, I just think Ohio State this could be Urban's best overall team defensively they replaced a lot of key guys but They've got talent. I mean, there's no doubt about there's the talent on board. So, and I like I've already, I've already gushed about Wisconsin way too much. <laughs> well, I I think as of right now, I'm picking Ohio State over Wisconsin as well. I, I mean, the big. So I don't want to pick that game yet. The big, was, yeah. Like I said. The, the big question for Wisconsin is, you know, the guys they have to replace on defense. You know, three guys in the secondary. They had you know a really young defensive line that have some injuries there as well. And yeah. It's that's kind of like what their season comes down to. It's yeah. you know it. These new guys in the secondary on the defensive line, if they step up, then then it, the ceiling they, for them raises. That's what I always look to, though, is by then they will have a complete season under, you know, a full season, the new guys. That's true. Know, if they're worth a darn. And uh, if that's they're not a worth a darn, they may not even be in that game. So, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, that, that's the way I look at it. I mean, I'm looking at team, two teams that could <clears throat> mature much, be much better, much different teams than they are the first five weeks of the year. Uh, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking at. Well, thanks for joining me, Tim. I sure, really man. appreciate it. You can uh, follow Tim on Twitter at Tim underscore May Sports. Yeah. And uh, read his stuff on uh, dispatch.com. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Jason underscore Galloway and visit madison.com for all of your Badgers football coverage. Thanks for listening.